This is WKRG News 5 Breaking News. I'm Devin right, Walsh. We are interrupting your program meeting. with some breaking news. Mobile Police Chief James Barber is making a statement on the shooting death of 19-year-old Michael Moore by a Mobile Police officer on Monday. Let's listen. Everybody's good? All right, again, thank you all for coming. I uh, apologize for the delay. Um, as you know, I continuously meet with the family members before we have these press conferences so that they are at least briefed on where we are in the investigation, what the evidence we believe shows so far. Uh, we do are, are going to update you today, but just to recap where we were in the previous investigation is that we do have an officer reporting to duty. Uh, we identify that officer today as Officer Harold Hurst. Uh, he is a four and a half year veteran of the Mobile Police Department and has been assigned to the third precinct for about three years. Just over three years, three and a half years. The um, incident began on his way Monday evening, shortly after 6 o'clock that evening, when he observed an abrupt left turn by a Lexus in front of him that nearly caused a crash or caused oncoming traffic to slam on brakes. The officer initiated a traffic stop at that point, made contact with the driver that did not present a driver's license as requested, but did present um, some information. That information was then ran on the mobile digital terminal or the computer systems within the car. At that point, according to witnesses inside the car, which there were two other individuals, one juvenile, one young adult male, uh, indicated at that point that the driver, Michael Moore, that has been identified as Michael Moore, uh, gained access to a weapon that was between the driver's seat and the console, uh, indicated to the other two passengers that the car had been reported stolen. Uh, that weapon was then placed on the right side waistband area of the shorts. Uh, as the officer realizes that he is dealing with a stolen car, we go from a traffic stop to a felony stop, to which backup has been requested. It's been notified that we are dealing with a stolen car. The officer proceeds back up toward the driver's side of the car to separate the driver from the other passengers in the car, has asked him to step out. We understand at that point, a uh, passenger or a passerby on Wagner Street sees the kid get out with the weapon in his waistband. The officer also sees the weapon. Uh, there are verbal commands, several verbal commands given not to reach for the weapon, at which time the officer, according to his statement, uh, Michael Moore attempts to gain access to the weapon. Shots were fired. Michael Moore was struck three times uh, during the incident. Search warrant was conducted yesterday uh, in which the car that was reported stolen was searched. Uh, we did recover several items that were taken from five different vehicle burglaries. Uh, most of those occurred between the evening hours of Sunday, June the 12th, and the morning hours of Monday, uh, June the 13th, which would have been the day of the shooting. And we have those items displayed for you here. One of them is a safe containing a lot of foreign currency, uh, but all of these, the victims of which have been identified uh, on five separate burglaries. Is there a, did we map this? Okay. Just to give you an idea of where this occurred within the city of Mobile, we did map it for you. Um, and you can see right here uh, on Pierpoint Drive is where the car was reported stolen. Uh, the owner of the car has been interviewed. There is no relation between Michael Moore, the person driving the car, or the um, owner of the car. And then you see the, uh, where the vehicle burglaries that we were able to confirm actually occurred. The uh, Ricker B place is where the safe was taken from. Uh, that one, we cannot tell exactly when it happened uh, because it wasn't realized by the owner until we actually recovered the safe that it was missing. Uh, we can answer any questions that we, you may have at this point. Can you tell us at this time, can you confirm the alleged stolen gun was recovered at the scene of the officer involved shooting? Now, the, 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 the gun uh, was recovered with the uh, body of Michael Moore at the ER room uh, by emergency medical personnel. Why was that? I'm sorry? Why was that? Is it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't protocol have to be recovered at the scene? Yes, protocol was recovered at the scene. The weapon was not recovered at the scene. It was transported with Michael Moore to the ER, and so that's where it was recovered. Can you explain how that happened? The weapon was not recovered, and therefore it was transported with the body. As soon as the paramedics got there, they lifted him, put him onto a gurney, and took off to the emergency room. Uh, the weapon had not been removed from the person of Michael Moore at that point. Um, I think the, the thing that a lot of people are going to have a hard time wrapping their heads around is that last time you did say that he was handcuffed. How could he have been handcuffed? An officer walked up to him, had a chance to handcuff him, but did not recover the gun from the scene. 
Well, handcuffing is part of the protocol, uh, but again, the weapon should have been recovered at the scene, was not recovered at the scene, was transported with Michael Moore, um, unknown to the paramedics that were transporting that he was alone. You also made mention that there were officers that got to the scene later that had body cam footage. Is there any body cam footage that suggests that, and do you plan on releasing that, that suggests that there was that gun? There, there is no plan to release any of the body cam footage. All of the body cam footage in the iPhone footage that we've seen so far are all post-incident. And so, but there are some that do corroborate some of the immediate actions taken by the officer immediately after the, the shooting. It shows the gun at the scene? Uh, the body cam footage, I don't know, as far as the body worn cameras post shooting, uh, but definitely what I'm telling you is as accurate as we know to exist. Can you tell the officer Ball's name and why are you releasing his name now? Well, there, we go through critical incident de-stress. One of the things I think that we seem to forget in this, these types of shootings uh, is not just the family uh, of the shooting victim uh, that has suffered in these. There's an incredible amount of emotional distress that goes on with any human being involved in taking someone's life. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that we were providing the mental health that this officer needed to de-stress him within 72 hours before we released the name. Chief, have there been any other allegations of misconduct against this officer? The, I'm sorry, good. Have there been any other allegations of misconduct? You're talking a historical record or disciplinary record. Uh, let me just say, uh, as far as I know, the there has been no previous shootings that the officer's been involved in, no sustained complaints of use of force. Uh, there may have been some minor misconduct violations, uh, but nothing major. And there's been some talk about the body camera. So can you explain when, they, when an officer comes into work to pick up a body camera, how they're assigned? Yeah, these body cameras are actually um, kept at the precincts in a docking station. So at the end of your shift, an officer puts them into a docking station, uploads the video from the shift that they worked, uh, and it also recharges the system so that when the officer returns, it's ready to go to the next shift. My yep, let me go. Was, uh, with the body cameras, obviously you can't even wear them when we have some definitive answers to a lot of questions. Because there's a gap there with the recharging, is there any type of... Uh, you know, policy change under consideration with your department? There is a policy review in process, and we are working with certain other officials as far as how do we uh, try to cover all these different loopholes. I don't think that there's any fail-safe policy that you can have to where every incident is recorded, uh, but we certainly want to be as thorough as we can in recording our incidents. And so uh, to answer your question, it, it, there, it is under review. Once all the right. officer... Wait for another officer to come before you confronted after realizing the vehicle has been there was a call for backup. Uh, where that backup was, I guess, will still uh, determine the investigation as far as how far, but it is actually up to an officer to make a decision at that point, uh, as far as officer safety, on whether or not he wants to approach and separate the driver from the others. That is the choice of action that this officer made, uh, was to separate the driver from the other people in the car. And regarding the stolen item, um, who exactly stole these, and, and will other people in that vehicle be charged? Well, let me make it really clear that we're not accusing anyone at this point of stealing anything. Uh, what we're telling you is that the gun was stolen, the car was stolen, they were in the car that was stolen, and these items were in the car that are related to five separate criminal investigations for unlawful breaking and entering a vehicle. So this time, none of the other two people will be charged? There has been no charges brought forth at this point, no. Is there any information on where the gun was stolen from, where that took place? Yes. It's, it should be in your packet there, but it's on, uh, Chief, can you tell on us, Thornhill Drive. Can you tell us the different agencies that are participating in this investigation and who has the lead? The, the lead agency on the state side is Mobile PD Internal Affairs Unit and Mobile PD Homicide Unit. On the federal side, the FBI Southern District of Mobile um, is investigating on the federal civil rights cases. Uh, those two criminal investigations on the MPD side goes to the district attorney's office who does a further investigation if needed and then does a presentation to the grand jury. The one on the federal side on the FBI investigation goes up to Civil Rights Division and Main Justice in Washington. On that note, Chief, I know you've talked a lot about transparency in this investigation. Um, can you go into that in a little bit more de detail, particularly with the autopsy? Uh, specifically about the autopsy. In, in, in regards and transparency? Yeah. Well, in order to be transparent, we did have an uh, invite the FBI in very early on, uh, as far as early as the first thing Tuesday morning, and ask for a parallel independent investigation. The autopsy, I'll tell you, did reveal that there were three gunshots um, that were consistent with the statements that were provided, uh, but outside of that, specifically about. So at this moment, Officer Hurst is still on administrative leave? 
Okay. Yes. Uh, again, he is still on administrative leave. Um, all we're doing today is just making the identification due to your request and the fact that he has been hooked up with the proper personnel to ensure that he has been cared for as far as his mental health. Are you concerned about safety releasing his picture and name? You know, I think in the environment that we live in in this country today, I think everybody should be very cognizant of the different threats that we face. Um, and certainly there has been an uptick in threatening activity and rhetoric. And so, yes, we are always concerned. We do take it very seriously. Um, and the safety of the public as well. So it's a paid leave, right? It is paid leave, yes. Will you release the name of the other as a matter of protocol, because the person hasn't been charged, we usually do not release the personal information of witnesses. And at this point, because they've not been charged, uh, they are considered witnesses in the investigation, not suspects. This would be, just to clarify, so MPD is the lead, uh, lead on this investigation as far as if this shooting was justified? No, that is not what was said. There are actually, you'll see a state investigation conducted, MPD lead from internal affairs and MPD homicide for the state side um, and that, the criminal review on that particular case would be the wrongful death of Michael Moore, which is a criminal charge. That will go through the state system, the district attorney's office, and the grand jury. On the civil rights side, that lead agency is FBI. Uh, that information will eventually be channeled up to Maine Justice Civil Rights Division in Washington. Is it standard for an officer not on duty with an alibi camp without that? It is at the discretion of the officer, but not for regular minor traffic violations. Uh, whenever there is a situation where there was a danger to the public, uh, then yes. So do you think you violated conduct by pulling more over? Not if we confirm the reason for the stop, which was cutting off traffic, nearly causing an accident. We'll take one more question. You said that the gun should have been removed from the scene. Is that the protocol to remove what was the threat immediately? So what is the protocol in that situation? Well, the protocol is actually to recover the obviously to recover any evidence or weapons at the scene uh, and not to transport them at the scene. Um, you're dealing with a very dynamic situation that is changing very frequently and so you've got one officer still waiting on backup and still dealing with three individuals as well as other individuals that are crossing the street. So what you've got is a situation where we have to wait for some backup. Now again, protocol would have been to take the weapon at the scene. It was not. It was transported with Michael Moore to USA Med when the paramedics got there. No, the information that we are providing to you actually came from the passengers that Michael Moore armed himself while in the car and the officers running the information and then got out of the car with the weapon. Are they, are they denying that he reached for the gun and the officer told him not to? They could not see what transpired other than hear the verbal commands once he stepped out of the car. How long do you expect this investigation to last? It, it, it depends. We still have an appeal out to the public. Anybody that has any information uh, related to this case, we certainly want to know that. If there's any video evidence taken from either uh, from iPhones or any other device, we would like to see that. Uh, but we will continue the investigation until we can run down all these different variables that we need answers to. And one more question. We also heard that this vehicle may belong to a girlfriend of Moore's family member. Do you know anything about that? Again, the vehicle's reported stolen. We have talked to the owners of the vehicle. There is no connection between them and Michael Moore. They do, do not know who Michael Moore is. You said you briefed the family right before you came in, but the family's been saying that they've been left out of the loop. What do you have to say about that? I'll tell you that we met with the mother and uh, that night at USA Medical Center. The door's been open ever since. We've had the press conference on Tuesday, met with family members on Tuesday prior to the press conference, which is why we were late making that one. Um, and before we met with this press conference, the family again invited in. And so that line of communication has been opened up. The evidence as we know it to exist today and that we've shared with you, we have shared with the family. Was there any third party in the autopsy room? Yes. There was um, the president of the NAACP Mobile Chapter asked for permission to attend the autopsy. We spoke with the district attorney, Ashley Rich, on Tuesday morning. That permission was granted. And so the president of the NAACP would have been the only non-law enforcement personnel that was present. Is it normal to have the NAACP in on autopsy? No, it's Are you not. about racial tension? By, is that why you... You know, number one, no, it's not normal for us to allow third parties or the NAACP in, but the NAACP made the request, and my personal opinion is the family has a right to an independent autopsy anyway. Um, and so there was, in the effort of transparency, as you said, the, it was actually better for us to not act like we had anything to hide and certainly invite that opportunity in. How's Officer Hurst doing at this time? 
You know, Officer Hurst is doing predictably. There's a lot of emotion to this. There's a lot of issues that he's trying to deal with, um, and certainly our hearts go out to him. I do want to say that we continue to offer condolences to the family as well of, of both families. Uh, there are two families that are suffering as a result of the incident that happened Monday. You certainly have the Michael Moore family, whom we, we spend a lot of time talking about, and I understand why but the family of the officer involved. And again, the first time he's ever involved in a situation like this is suffering immensely as well. And so our hearts go out to them. We do thank the community for their continuing support. Uh, we do also uh, want to thank everybody for their prayers uh, for both families going forward. And I just think you have this evidence out here. What's the point of having this evidence out here today? You know, we had a, there was a lot of dispute on whether or not the evidence we said existed actually existed. And so, you know, uh, that's why we provided the evidence um, on what was actually recovered um, and how it's connected to the vehicle that we uh, eventually stopped on Monday evening. So there is nothing further than that um, as a reason. It appears it's kind of petty that it's gum, cologne, a visor. So, and you also say nobody's going to be charged right now. Do you expect charges to be later on? You can see fingerprint dust on these various items. You also see fingerprint dust on the vehicles that were broken into. And so as we continue that investigation, and again, uh, we've not been able to have the opportunity to question anybody related to the auto burglaries. This information just became available to us yesterday evening. And so we're only less than 72 hours into the investigation. There are a lot of unanswered questions. And so we will continue our investigation until we have those answers. Let me just make a, a brief statement about the, you know, these are challenging times and y'all hear me say that. And I talked to city council about this exact issue um, just Tuesday. But these are challenging times for law enforcement. Events across this country have called into question the trust between law enforcement and communities within our communities and certain communities. Um, but in the, words, uh, in the words of Bill Bratton, the police commissioner from the city of New York, um, we all need to learn to see each other uh, and see each other from each other's perspectives here. And so we in law enforcement need to learn to see what it's like to be a law-abiding citizen in a high-crime neighborhood that is under the scrutiny of the police. And we need to understand what that person sees when they see a police car coming down the road. But we as a country and we as a community need to see what the police see. And you need to see what we see through the windshields of our cars as we patrol these beats in high crime areas. And we need to see what the police see inside that crime scene tape. Because when we do see that, when we learn to see each other, truly see each other, new understanding will begin. And that new understanding will bring facts instead of myths. It will bring to us truths instead of untruths. And when that new thinking begins, we together as a country can begin to heal. But so long as we continue this divide and refuse to see each other from the perspectives that we need to be looking from, we are going to continue to have this type of reaction. Thank you all for attending. And we will be back with you. Well, you have been listening to Mobile Police Chief James Barber saying that the department has been very transparent with the family and with the public after the shooting death of teenager Michael Moore Monday night. Some new information coming out today. The name of the officer involved in that shooting, Harold Hurst, who is a four and a half year veteran of the Mobile Police Department. Also, one detail that came out from Chief Barber today is that the gun was recovered at the ER by emergency personnel still on the waistband of Michael Moore. A lot of people taking issues issue because police protocol was not followed. They did not remove that weapon from the scene. We are going to have a live report from News 5's Alan Carter in about four minutes on News 5 at 5. We will have more on this police shooting today in just a few minutes. I'm Devin Walsh and we will return you to your regular program.